Welcome everybody, I'm Brian McCord, president of the McCord Foundation. And on behalf of the entire foundation, we'd like to welcome you to the 2022 Educational Update. Today, we will have some of the finest minds from Mass General, Brigham and Women's, and Cedar sinai presenting on some of the latest topics in MS, Alzheimer's, and ALS. I'd like to take an opportunity to thank all of our sponsors for being a part of this day, but especially our major sponsors, that being UBS Financial, EMD Serono, and MT Pharma. But again, all of the corporations that are being a part of this and making this day so successful. As you all know, our mission is to help cure neurologic diseases. And this is why events like this are so important to us. Today, we'll be broadcasting a virtual portion of this day. So it gives us the ability to have an in-person and virtual option. So we'll have people from all over the country being a part of this. It's exciting because again, it's important to get the latest information out there. So thank you so much to all of you for being a part of it. Get ready for some exciting information. Take advantage of all the Q&A. And thanks again for being a part of the McCourt Foundation. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the McCord Foundation Education Update. As Kelsey said, my name is Steve Seipek, Senior Vice President at UBS Financial Services right here in Rockland, Mass. And UBS is excited and eager to support the McCord Foundation in their great work and mission by sponsoring today's event. As you know, you'll be hearing from some of the top doctors from Mass General Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Senior Sider Medical Center on their progress and developments in the areas of Alzheimer's excuse me, uh, ALS and multiple sclerosis. You know, we believe that the financial services industry can not only help families plan for their future, but certainly can help support in the critical research and awareness of these neurological diseases that we're gonna learn more about today. I personally have been impacted, my family has, by uh, MS and Alzheimer's. So this means a lot to me today, this uh, being in attendance. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Har Howard Weiner, co-director of the Ann Romney Center at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Weiner. Uh, thank you very much. I realize that I can just use this microphone. I'm not sure. Is that okay? All right, can you hear me? Good, all right. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank to the McCourt Foundation for putting this on. Uh, we have people here in the audience and we have also people on Zoom. So all those on Zoom, hello. And we will be taking questions uh, uh, later on. So the, uh, my background is basically, uh, for most of my life, in multiple sclerosis, studying multiple sclerosis, which is an immune disease. It's a disease of the immune system. And we actually have a number of treatments for MS. But as we've uh, studied MS, uh, it became clear that the immune system could also be used for other diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS. So we, we have some very exciting things going on in Alzheimer's related to the immune system. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you about. Uh, on the screen, you could see that I have two things, one, something that everybody is very interested in, the nasal vaccine, which has started, and I'll tell you the whole story of the nasal vaccine and how that works. And another area related to the immune system is the microbiome or the gut, and I'll talk to you about that as well. So here's the first picture. This is a picture, it's a man and two little girls. This was actually taken in Vienna in the uh, 30s. Uh, you don't recognize any of these people, but I do. This is my grandfather, this is my aunt, and this is my mother. So this is my mother when she was a, a young girl in Vienna. They came to the United States. Here's my mother as a 
beautiful woman. I can call her a beautiful woman. She's my mother, but I think you'll all agree. And this is my mother later on when she developed Alzheimer's disease. And I don't know if you can tell, but she has this hollow look in her eyes as she slowly lost her ability to think and then ultimately to recognize me. I know she knew I was a doctor that worked on brain disease. And she says to me, how, when, when she got the Alzheimer's, she said, Howard, you're a brain doctor. Can't you do anything to help me? So this was a number of years ago. Sadly, we couldn't, but now uh, hopefully we're going to work on something that can. So uh, one of the things that I've thought about as we do our research is I think about the brain as a crime scene. In other words, there's a crime going on in the brain and uh, we have to solve it. So when you think about a regular crime scene where someone's murdered and a glass is broken and a key is on the floor, you got to figure it out. But uh, the crime scene that we're working on are, uh, is in the brain and what goes on there. And I just wrote this book. It's called The Brain Under Siege. And it uh, tells the story of uh, the, many of the diseases that we're uh, talking about here at the, Mort at the McCourt Foundation, Alzheimer's, ALS, multiple sclerosis, where we describe um, the crime scene and tell the story of where we are. Uh, Hollywood has bought the rights to this book and they're gonna make a docu-series, which I'm very excited about because it'll bring awareness to everybody. Proceeds go to research and you can get this on Amazon if you so like. So here's the crime scene in Alzheimer's disease. This is from the book and here you can see the brain. It's a little shrunken and there's three or four major things here. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, neurofibrillary tangles, another one is microglial activation, and another thing is tau. And these major areas of the crime scene is what we're targeting with our vaccine. So what, what are the defining characteristics of Alzheimer's? As I mentioned, there's amyloid plaques, which is a sticky substance that accumulates in the brain. This then causes neurofibrillary tangles in the brain, and this also causes inflammation uh, with microglial cells in the brain. We lose neurons, connections, and many other neurotransmitter deficits. And this is what causes the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Here's a picture of the A-beta plaques in the neurofibrillary tangles. This is a plaque, and these are the uh, tangles. Uh, very important, around these plaques, there's inflammation. Now, you can't recognize it unless you're a pathologist, but there's inflammatory cells, sort of like you get a pneumonia and there's cells in the um, lung that cause problems. So you have cells here in the brain and that's another target at the crime scene. So when we diagnose uh, Alzheimer's, it's neurofibrillary tangles that are inside the cell and amyloid plaques that are outside the cell. We can visualize this by imaging. This is PET, Im PET imaging of amyloid and tau. And this is a a control person, and here you can see the abnormal amyloid in the brain of this Alzheimer's patients, and here the am abnormal tau. And this is how we diagnose am uh, uh, Alzheimer's and how we follow it. This tells you that there are biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease that occur at different times. Uh, abnormal is in, in amyloid, in tau, this area here is before people have symptoms. Uh, and here they begin to have symptoms. We're now developing new biomarkers and uh, blood tests so that you, you don't necessarily have to do this imaging. Uh, Dennis Selko and his group at the Brigham are working on that. And that could be very important for deciding who gets the nasal vaccine. Another very important clue to the disease, a very important clue to the crime scene, are genes. One of the ways that we study 
a disease, all diseases, if, is we find are there certain genes involved? And if there's a certain gene, that gives us a clue because that shows that that gene is triggering something. Genes, of course, are very important at determining so many things, hair color, how tall you are, and certain diseases. And the important point here is you don't have to know all these genes, is that there's many genes related to the immune system in Alzheimer's. That's a clue that we might do something with the immune system. There's also genes related to amyloid. A very important gene is called presenilin. And if you have that presenilin gene, you really have a big risk for Alzheimer's. There's another gene called ApoE4. If you have that, you have a big risk. And we test for those genes. For those of you who saw the movie Still Alice, the lead character there, Julianne Moore, who won an Academy Award, had the gene for presenilin. But we also now know that immune-related genes are important, and this is the, one of the basis for doing the nasal vaccine. So here's a picture of what I'm gonna tell you about the nasal vaccine. It says immunity in Alzheimer's disease, nasal vaccine. So right in the middle, you have the amyloid. You see all the amyloid is stuck here. We don't want all that amyloid. And in order <clears throat> to clear the amyloid, we want cells to come in from the blood these are called monocytes. Here's a picture of them. They come in and they clear out the amyloid. And that's the initial nasal vaccine. I'll tell you about that. We also can give another thing nasally, a monoclonal antibody that takes care of the microglia that are inflamed. And you see this microglia now is a better microglia and uh, these uh, then help the disease. So here's the story of the nasal vaccine. You probably don't know this, but in the year 2000, they wanted to treat Alzheimer's by immunizing people uh, with the amyloid, to immunize people with the amyloid, and they found that that worked in animals. And they were very excited about that, so they began treating Alzheimer's patients by immunizing them, giving them a shot with the amyloid, and they found out that some of the patients of these Alzheimer's patients got encephalitis. And this encephalitis looked just like MS, so that instead of treating Alzheimer's, they um, caused MS in these Alzheimer's uh, patients. So obviously the trial had to be stopped. And we then, uh, since I work on MS, I said, well, let me try and see what happens if I take an Alzheimer's mouse and I immunize it like they did and give it MS, what would happen? Is an Alzheimer's mouse more susceptible to MS? So here's the experiment, and it was very uh, surprising and exciting. So this is the brain, and the green is the amyloid that we don't like, okay? And here is animals that are immunized with the amyloid, but these are the animals that were given the MS, called EAE, and it cleared all the amyloid. So we are very excited about that, but you can't treat Alzheimer's by giving people, uh, Alzheimer's patients, MS. There's some data, by the way, that people who have MS have a little less risk for Alzheimer's. And so we did a lot of work in the laboratory, and we came up with a compound that we're using for our vaccine called protolin. And the protolin uh, prevents amyloid deposition in a mouse model of uh, Alzheimer's. Protolin comes from a different bacteria. They're here and they've been used for influenza vaccines, etc. And this is what the protolin looks like, how you make it. This is the nasal vaccine that we use. It has two components. Um, these are outer membrane vesicles and this is LPS. They come together. And this is the nasal vaccine that we're using. So what is protolin? Uh, it's an adjuvant, which means it stimulates the immune system, and we think it stimulates the immune system in a positive way. It can be given intranasally. It, um, uh, it can be dosed more than once, and it doesn't cross into the brain. Some people think that this nasal vaccine is to put something in the brain, but it's not. The nasal vaccine is to stimulate the immune system and then the immune cells go into the brain. And here's the experiment in animals, they're very dramatic. So here you have 
we took, um, I can't read that, I think it's five month old or eight month old uh, animals and we treated them for eight months and these are the animals that weren't treated and look at all the amyloid in the brain. And in the ones that got the nasal vaccine, there's almost no amyloid. Yeah, these are five month old mice. Here we take older mice, this would be someone who already has Alzheimer's, they have more amyloid in the brain and again, the nasal vaccine really reduces it. Um, so now the question is, how does the nasal vaccine work? Um, and what we think is that the nasal vaccine goes into the nose, goes into the lymph nodes in the neck and then stimulates monocytes, which are white blood cells. And those white blood cells then go to the brain and clear out the amyloid. Now this is a scientific experiment, so I don't expect you to understand everything, but what you can understand is this is the uptake of the amyloid by the monocytes. This is that got the nasal vaccine. These are the monocytes or the blood cells from the patients that didn't get it. And this is very important because this gives us a blood test to measure whether the vaccine is working. It's sort of like the COVID vaccines. When you get the COVID vaccine, you can do a, a test to see whether they have antibodies, whether the immune system got activated. So we can tell whether the nasal vaccine is activating the immune system. And this has been tested in humans. Uh, apart from a little irritation in the nose, it's safe. And the FDA allowed us to go directly into Alzheimer's patients. We didn't have to treat uh, healthy volunteers. So we've started the trial. Many of you may have heard about it. So the human trial began in November of 2021. So about uh, four or five months ago. And the purpose is to reduce the amyloid in the brain because we think it's the amyloid that causes problem in Alzheimer's. And the amyloid also triggers the tau. So how do you now take this uh, into a treatment? So first you do a phase one study. And the purpose of the phase one study is to establish safety and to determine the dose that stimulates these blood cells. So we already know it, it, it's safe in some of the people, but we've begun to treat our patients. And who are we treating? We're, te we're taking people with mild Alzheimer's. They have to have uh, positive imaging by PET scan. They have to show that they have the amyloid. And we're giving them four doses, 100 micrograms, 500, 1,000, and 1,500. And we're gonna see which dose is best at stimulating the monocytes. We've already given the 100 and now we're given the uh, 500. Uh, three patients get it per group and there's one control. And uh, they get two doses. It's sort of like the COVID vaccine. They get an initial dose and they get a second dose two weeks later. Uh, and then we measure their blood, and there are four patients uh, per group. So here's how the vaccine is given. This is Dr. Tanuja Chitnis, who's running our trial. This is yours truly. Uh, I'm not getting the actual vaccine. This is a, a syringe with salt water in it, but it shows you exactly uh, how the patients get the nasal vaccine. They come into the Brigham. Seth Gale is involved in this, and it's just a little spray. It's very easy to take and um, could ultimately give in, uh, at home. So what happens uh, in the next phase? So the next phase we think will begin uh, in about a year from now. We'll take mild patients. And this time we're probably gonna treat them for a year. And we're gonna measure amyloid pet, pet. We'll measure their blood biomarkers, cognitive function. And we assume there'll be 100 patients. 50 will get treated and 50 will get the placebo. And then if that is uh, successful, we'll then move to a, a final set of trials, also where we look at PET biomarkers. And here we'll probably treat people for two years. And there may be like 500 patients, could be more in two different groups. And the FDA requires two separate trials for approval. So we'll have to do two trials at the same time. But we're very excited, to be honest, I've worked on this for over 20 years from the beginning, and it's very exciting to finally uh, get this into people. And philanthropy has played a big role at the Ann Romney Center, the McCourt Foundation, 
this has allowed us to move it uh, forward. If this is positive, then this will become available to uh, people. The next part of a nasal vaccine that we're working on, remember I told you there was a crime scene and that there was amyloid and tau. The other part of the crime scene are the microglial cells that are activated. And that's this part of the nasal vaccine, which is over here. And this is also something that's given nasally. It isn't the protolin, but it's called a monoclonal antibody is given nasally. And uh, here's the uh, inflammation that we're looking at. This is a healthy patient. This is an Alzheimer's patient. And this is the microglial activation. These are inflamed microglia, just like you have pneumonia, it's inflamed. And we've given this to some MS patients now. The name of the drug is called feralimab, this nasal uh, monoclonal. And this is an MS patient. And you could see the red. This is all the inflammation in the microglia. And this is after he's been treated. And you can see how the inflammation has gone away. So we're about ready to talk to the FDA to use the second part of the nasal vaccine uh, for Alzheimer's. So this is a summary of the nasal vaccine for Alzheimer's that we're working on. One thing is protolin. We're using this now to clear the A-beta. The other is feralimab, which reduces microglial activation. And we can treat those who have AD. Now it's mild. It could be more severe AD. And we think prophylactically it could be given ultimately to people at risk. Now, when you think about blood pressure, we treat blood pressure to lower your blood pressure. And if we treat the blood pressure, people don't have as many heart attacks or strokes. And so we can do blood tests now, people who are asymptomatic but have amyloid in the brain and could be getting Alzheimer's, and it could be given uh, prophylactically, and that's what we ultimately hope for. I guess I'm going backwards. There I go. I'm going to mention one other final thing because this is, the micro, this is immunology, and it's called the human microbiome. Um, I usually have a quiz and ask people how many bacteria they think they have in the gut, and people say a million, a billion. It's actually three or four trillion. We have all these bacteria in our gut, and they're very important for our health. And there's a connection between the gut and the brain. This is a picture that shows that. And these are animal studies where we took some animals uh, who were older and we gave them a certain bacteria and we measured the inflammation in the brain and it actually helps them. And uh, it can decrease the amyloid, et cetera. So we think another treatment that we're going to develop is a, a pill or something that affects the gut and affects the microbiome and could help uh, patients with Alzheimer's. And here's how the microbiome uh, could work. This is a crime scene. It could affect the plaques. It could affect the neurodegeneration and could help bring in more cells into the brain. So if you want to help us to investigate the microbiome and the nasal vaccine in Alzheimer's, we'd be happy to hear from you. I'm giving you my email. It's right here. If you want to email me, I can then give you a a place to contact where you could be tested to see if you're available to do the nasal vaccine. If you want to give us a sample uh, to study the microbiome, we'd appreciate that very much. So don't be shy. Email me if you want to help us investigate the microbiome or participate or learn about the nasal vaccine. Again, here's the book. And uh, I spent five years uh, writing it, and I think it's a little dense scientifically, but it's for the lay audience, and people really enjoy reading about, uh, about the disease. Finally, I have another slide here. It says, what is life? There's a big question for you. Uh, and I was a philosophy major in college and was very interested in life's big questions, so I made a movie. You can't study this in the lab. I made a movie called What is Life? The Movie, where I interviewed people and... Um, Ask them all the big questions. Is there a God? Why is there evil? Is there free will? Of course, there's no answers, but I traveled the world and people gave me their results or their answers. I won some Los Angeles Film Awards. Here are the Film Awards. And 
here it says, what is life, the movie, and here it says director, not doctor, so I was happy about that. If you want to see the movie, you can watch it for free on YouTube, put in what is life, Howard Weiner. And then I made another movie, and this relates more to Alzheimer's. This is a real Hollywood movie called Abe and Phil's Last Poker Game. It was at the Tribeca Film Festival. Starred Martin Landau, the Academy Award winning actor. He played an old doctor who went to a home with his wife who had Alzheimer's. He couldn't take care of her. Uh, he's a Jewish doctor. And then he meets Paul Sorvino, the guy who was in Goodfellas, who plays an old Italian womanizer and gambler. And they become friends. They're improbable friends. The person in the middle is a nurse who's adopted, and she's got a note that her father's in this home. She meets these two old guys, and they both want to be her father. So it's a nice uh, story. And here's a review of it in the Village Voice uh, saying that they gave some of their nice uh, performances. You could look at that on iTunes or Amazon if you want to. Finally, I show a picture of the Ann Romney Center for Neurologic Diseases where we do our research. Um, I co-direct that with Dennis Selko, who's an expert in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, here's a picture of Ann Romney when we launched the center. We we're on CNN here, they really weren't interested in talking to me. They only wanted to talk to her and ask about presidential politics. So I sat very quietly. I always end my uh, talks with the word hope. Uh, when I first began working in MS, there were no treatments for MS. We now have 15 or 20 treatments. The progressive uh, form of the disease is the hardest. Uh, I think there's now hope for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we're beginning to get treatments and I'm confident uh, that we will ultimately have a treatment and a cure for Alzheimer's. And organizations like the McCourt Foundation are key for us to understand and treat these diseases. So thank you very much. Pull up my slides. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Alberto Serrano Pozo, and I'm a, an assistant professor of neurology at MGH and Harvard Medical School. And as such, I, I see I take care of patients with uh, memory problems, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and other types of dementia. And I do uh, well lab research um, on, on Alzheimer's disease. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the McCourt uh, Foundation for organizing this event and uh, to the, the sponsors uh, for making it possible. And uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the contributions of glial cells to Alzheimer's disease. And, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, grateful to Dr. Weiner because he already introduced some of these glial cells. Um, uh, I hope that by the end of the talk, uh, you'll feel as curious as I am about the role of these glial cells in Alzheimer's disease. Here in this um, uh, background, this first slide, you can see how beautiful these uh, glial cells are. Uh, in uh, orange and blue, you can see these uh, star-shaped uh, cells, which are called astrocytes. And uh, in magenta, uh, you can see the other kind of uh, glial cell that I'm going to be talking about, uh, which is called microglia. Uh, but first things first, uh, this is my disclosure slide. Uh, uh, none of these uh, sponsors, uh, uh, what I'm going to present has nothing to do with these uh, two sponsors. They have no sponsor in this uh, work that I'm presenting to you. Um, this is the outline of uh, my talk. Uh, I'm going to be uh, giving you an introduction uh, uh, to the glial cells and to APOE. Um, then I'm going to be presenting two stories that we uh, recently published in our group. Uh, the first one is uh, the association between the APOE gene and the rate of cognitive decline uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease. And the second story uh, that I'm going uh, to be explaining to you is uh, the association between this APOE gene and, and the reactions of these glial cells to the Alzheimer's pathology. Let's start with the introduction. Uh, we have known these glial cells for a century now. Uh, uh, the, uh, 
uh, gentlemen here in these uh, 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 photographs uh, are considered the fathers of neuroscience. And they described these uh, glial cells already uh, more than one century ago at the beginning of the 20th century. And just by using a rudimentary optic microscope, uh, some chemicals to uh, stain the tissue sections, and a pen and paper uh, to draw what they saw. And, and these are some of the uh, drawings that they left behind. Uh, in the left here, you can see an astrocyte uh, drawn by uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Uh, I wouldn't be a good Spaniard if I didn't mention him uh, in this talk. <laughs> And uh, you can see how it's uh, a very uh, ramified cell with a cell body and uh, multiple branches that uh, branch out in finer uh, processes. And uh, to the right, you can see uh, several microglial cells as drawn by Rio Ortega, who was a disciple, was Cajal's disciple. And uh, they can have uh, different shapes. Uh, some, some of them are rod-like. Uh, some of them are more ramified, and uh, uh, as Dr. Weiner uh, mentioned, they can become uh, amoeboid uh, in the presence of uh, uh, injury in the brain. Um, uh, in the bottom here, you can see uh, some astrocytes as drawn by Alois Alzheimer's himself uh, like more than one century ago. These uh, gentlemen already hinted at many of the functions of these uh, glial cells in the brain. Uh, just by looking at them under the microscope. Uh, of course, in this century, we, we have made a lot of progress uh, uh, in understanding the role of these uh, cells in the normal brain. Um, the main uh, function of the astrocytes is uh, to support the neurons, the nerve cells, uh, 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 in their functions. They provide uh, trophic support to the, to the uh, neurons. They modulate uh, the synaptic activity of the neurons. They are uh, present with these fine processes uh, in the synapses or connections between the neurons, and uh, they modulate that uh, neuronal activity. Uh, without the astrocytes, the neurons would be firing nonstop and uh, uh, we'd be having seizures uh, all the time. They also provide energy uh, to the neurons when the neurons are deprived of energy, for example, in situations of low glucose, they also help uh, produce and repair the myelin uh, in the brain, which is this insulation uh, sheath that uh, uh, wraps the, uh, the, the nerve fibers in the brain. They are also part of the blood-brain barrier and regulate the blood flow uh, to the brain, um, uh, adjusting that blood flow to the uh, activity of the neurons. And they are uh, also helping remove the waste from the brain through this perivascular uh, brain uh, drainage system uh, that is called the lymphatic uh, pathway. And finally, they respond to injury, uh, forming um, a scar around the injury to isolate the damage. And in that context, they can release inflammatory or anti-inflammatory molecules. The uh, microglia, on the other hand, are uh, slightly different. They are constantly moving around, uh, surveilling the environment. And uh, whenever there is uh, uh, something abnormal, uh, because they are the innate immune cells of the brain, they react uh, and they engulf uh, and dying neurons or viruses or uh, bacteria or whatever uh, uh, strange agent uh, is in the environment. And they can also secrete um, uh, inflammatory molecules, so they are the main mediators of uh, brain inflammation, as Dr. Weiner alluded to. Uh, they also participate in the uh, in, in, uh, development of the, of the brain. They uh, eliminate redundant uh, neurons, redundant uh, connections between the neurons, uh, so that the circuits are uh, refined uh, during development. In the uh, Alzheimer's brain, um, these uh, cells react to the plaques and, and the tangles, uh, uh, as uh, uh, you saw the crime scene um, metaphor of, of uh, the Weiner's. Uh, 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 so here's that crime scene. You see in, in the left uh, the plaques in uh, green and uh, these reactive astrocytes surrounding the plaques and uh, Trying, it looks like they are trying to form a barrier uh, to isolate uh, whatever damage the plaques are causing. 
but at the same time, they may be releasing these inflammatory uh, molecules that, that could be harmful. So the role of the astrocytes in this context is still uh, uh, debated. In the right, you can see the astrocytes wrapping and infiltrating uh, the tangles. Uh, the tangles are in green here, uh, and they're infiltrating by the red cells, which are the astrocytes. A similar picture uh, can be seen with uh, the microglia. In the left, uh, you have microglia with, uh, stained, stained with two markers, uh, a red marker and a, and a green marker, and uh, especially the red uh, microglia are very close to the plaques, which are stained here in blue, and uh, sort of reacting to them. But we also describe uh, how microglia can be very close to the tangles and in, in, really in contact with the tangles, and, and it does look like they are trying to engulf uh, some of this material, uh, as you can see here. Now, switching a little bit gears, uh, I, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of background about the APOE gene. Um, as, as with any gene, we have uh, two copies, uh, one from mom and one from dad. and, and in the case of APOE, there are three variants, uh, which are uh, number two, three, and four. And uh, the most common variant is uh, the, the three variant. So we use the APOE33 uh, genotype as a reference. And already in 1993, uh, we learned that uh, the APOE4 vari variant increases the risk uh, of developing Alzheimer's disease whereas the APOE2 variant is uh, protective against Alzheimer's disease. So people who are uh, E4, E4, who have two copies of the four variant, they have up to 10 times higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease compared to people who are 3-3. And uh, people who are 2-2, uh, who have two variants, two, two variants of, the, uh, of the APOE2 uh, allele, they have about half the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease compared to people who are 3-3. Now, the, uh, having two copies of the two variant uh, is really rare. Uh, uh, but uh, already in 1993, we learned that these uh, variants not only affect the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but also the age of onset of the uh, symptoms. Um, the APOE2 uh, uh, variant delays the onset. This is a survival curve uh, in which you can see the percent free uh, from Alzheimer's dementia in the y-axis and the H in the x-axis. And as you can see, the APOE2 uh, carriers uh, have a later onset of the uh, Alzheimer's dementia compared to the APOE4 uh, carriers. Now, uh, that is very clear and it's been clear for uh, uh, 30 years, uh, but what is very controversial is whether the APOE uh, gene variants uh, affect the rate of cognitive, uh, of cognitive decline once the symptoms have uh, started. And as you can see, there are many uh, papers that uh, report that APOE4 accelerates the rate of cognitive decline, but there are also many papers that report that uh, the effect of APOE4 is uh, neutral with regards to the uh, rate of cognitive decline. Even some papers uh, concluded that the APOE4 uh, variant slows down the progression of, of, of Alzheimer's uh, once the symptoms have started. And only a few papers uh, have reported that the APOE2 variant slows down the progression. And this is an important question because when we see uh, patients in the clinic, uh, there's not two patients that uh, behave the same way in terms of the, uh, their uh, rate of progression. We see uh, a, a high degree of heterogeneity in the degree of, of, of uh, in, this, in the uh, rate of progression, the speed of, uh, uh, of the disease. Uh, with some uh, patients uh, advancing very fast in five years, they're severely demented, and other patients uh, uh, surviving 20 years with a very slow uh, cause of the disease. So we uh, try to answer this question whether the APOE genotype impacts the rate of cognitive decline after symptom onset, and uh, specifically whether it does so independently of its effects on, on the brain pathology. The, uh, we think we know how APOE4 uh, increases the risk of Alzheimer's. Uh, many studies have uh, shown that uh, the main uh, driver of uh, Alzheimer's in APOE4 people is an increase 
of the amyloid plaques. Uh, APOE4 increases the amyloid plaques by uh, uh, accelerate, accelerating the aggregation of the amyloid uh, protein and also by inhibiting the clearance of the amyloid protein from the brain. It is also well known that APOE4 increases uh, the amount and severity of CAA. CAA stands for cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And it's just to say that amyloid also deposits in the, vessel, uh, in the vessels of the brain, in the wall of, of the vessels. And uh, that is also enhanced by APOE4. Recent studies have shown that APOE4 may also induce uh, Lewy bodies in the brain. Lewy bodies are a different uh, kind of uh, lesion in the brain uh, made by a different protein called alpha-synuclein. And uh, um, uh, it, recent papers have shown that uh, people who are APOE4 are more prone to have Lewy bodies in the brain. Some studies have also shown that uh, APOE4 people are more likely to have small vessel disease of the brain. This is a narrowing of the small vessels of the brain and that occurs normally with age, but it may be that APOE4 accelerates that process. And uh, also some studies, although I put this in dotted lines because it's still controversial, have shown that APOE4 increases uh, the chances to have another protein in the brain called TDP43, which uh, can also deposit in the neurons, is different from amyloid and tau, and is different from alpha-synuclein. And it goes along with this hypocampal sclerosis, uh, which is another condition that uh, uh, causes memory loss. What about the tangles, the tau tangles? Uh, we think that uh, the amyloid plaques are upstream of the tangles. Um, that somehow, we don't know what are the links in between these two lesions, uh, but somehow amyloid plaques induce uh, tau, tau uh, uh, aggregation and, and spreading in the brain in the form of tangles. Um, some studies have also shown that APOE4 can directly induce the tangles independently of the plaques. Um, in any case, all these co-pathologies, all these uh, different pathologies, contribute to cognitive, cognitive decline uh, to some extent. And it is very common to see uh, when we uh, uh, analyze the brains under the microscope of our patients to see multiple pathologies. Even though we diagnose the patient with Alzheimer's disease during life, oftentimes we see uh, other pathologies uh, as well in the brain that uh, um, coexist with the tangles and the plaques and that uh, were probably contributing to the uh, dementia of the patient, but we were not able to diagnose them during life because they are not good biomarkers for uh, Lewy bodies, for example, or for TDP43 pathology. Our question, the question that we try to answer is whether once you account for all these pathologies, APOE4 uh, cost, contributes to uh, the cognitive decline rate independently of those pathologies. Holding constant all these pathologies, thus APOE4 uh, accelerates the rate of cognitive decline compared to APOE3. And to answer that question, we uh, leverage a large data set uh, called the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center, or NAC. Uh, this is a longitudinal study that uh, is being run since uh, 2005 uh, by more than 30 Alzheimer's disease centers across the country including the Massachusetts Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, and that as of November 2018 had more than 39,000 uh, participants, of whom uh, more than 5,000 had donated the brain. So we selected uh, for our study uh, those uh, people who uh, had donated the brain and had an APOE genotype available, who were older or uh, 50 years old uh, uh, at, at the time of uh, disease, who uh, had the last clinical evaluation and the last memories uh, test uh, within two years from death, and who had a, a primary pathological diagnosis of a normal brain or some Alzheimer's changes. Uh, we allowed that uh, some of the other pathologies that I just showed you uh, were present in the brain, but we excluded those uh, individuals who had, uh, the, the, as primary diag uh, pathological diagnosis, uh, a different disease, uh, uh, like uh, Lewy body de uh, dementia or 
ALS or uh, Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease, all those uh, uh, individuals were excluded from our analysis to focus on, on the Alzheimer's uh, rate of cognitive decline. We uh, measure uh, the uh, two outcome cognitive measures, the mini mental uh, score, which uh, goes from zero to 30, 30 being normal and zero being uh, severe dementia. And also another one called the CDR sum of boxes, which goes from zero to 18. Uh, but I'm not gonna talk about it because of the uh, time limitations. I'm gonna only talk about uh, the MMSC or mini mental score. And we use a, a novel a statistical modeling in which we consider the time zero as the time of death and then analyze the trajectories of this uh, mini mental score in reverse time uh, in order to be able to link uh, the cognitive trajectory to uh, the autopsy findings in the brain. And uh, when, when we uh, look at the subset of people with uh, low or intermediate Alzheimer's pathology, low or intermediate plaques or, or tangles, uh, we obtain these results. Um, I'm uh, zooming in these, uh, 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 these lines here, these uh, slopes here. And as you can see, uh, the APOE4 carriers holding constant uh, age, sex, education, and uh, all other pathologies, uh, uh, all, all, all that list of other pathologies that I, 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 I showed you before, APOE4 carriers uh, decline faster than APOE3 and APOE2 carriers, uh, and that was statistically significant. When we uh, focus on people with uh, intermediate or high uh, levels of Alzheimer's pathology, meaning uh, late stages of, of the Alzheimer's uh, process, we found similar results. Uh, here, uh, you'll see that there is a, a change point here. The, mo the best fit model uh, was uh, one with a change point because uh, this uh, mini mental score has a floor effect in advanced dementia. So uh, we focus on the period before that change point, um, before three years uh, from death. As you can see, the APOE4 carriers uh, had a slower decline in these uh, advanced uh, uh, dementia patients compared to the APOE3 and APOE4 uh, carriers. So once uh, uh, we got these results, we um, uh, were very intrigued about what is the uh, uh, factor related to APOE that is driving these uh, differences in the rate of progression. We have accounted for all the other pathologies that APOE4 can induce uh, in those uh, statistical models. So it must be something else. And of course, we turn our attention to uh, the glial cells and, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason is that actually APOE is produced by these glial cells, and this has been known for many years. Uh, astrocytes are the main source of the APOE uh, gene product, which is the apolipoprotein E. This uh, protein is actually a transporter of cholesterol in the brain, and it's produced mainly by the astrocytes, but also by the microglial cells. It's um, transporting these uh, lipids uh, around the brain, uh, uh, within the brain, and we know that, as I told you, that uh, it promotes, uh, uh, especially when it's E4, it promotes a beta aggregation uh, amyloid beta aggregation in the form of plaques and also in the form of cerebral amyloid angiopathy here in the, in the uh, uh, vessel wall. Um, by contrast, the interaction between the APOE protein and, and the tau tangles represented here in this, uh, inside this neuron uh, is, uh, has not never been demonstrated. So it looks like, as I told you before, APOE4 works pr primarily through uh, amyloid, not through tau. The other reason why we turn to uh, the glial cells is that recent uh, data has ha shown that APOE4, the APOE4 variant is associated with an abnormal astrocyte and microglial responses. This uh, data came from uh, cell models, specifically human-induced uh, pluripotent stem cell-derived astrocytes and microglia, and from uh, mouse models, uh, specifically uh, transgenic mice that are uh, genetically engineered to uh, express the human APOE uh, in the location of the mouse APOE. 
uh, those studies showed that ApoE4 microglia and astrocytes have abnormal functions when it comes to uh, phagocytosis, the engulfing of uh, 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 the engulfing of amyloid beta, uh, and also with regards to inflammation, with ApoE4 microglia and astrocytes being more inflammatory than ApoE3. To uh, but there, there, there was no data on the human brain with regards to uh, the, the effects of APOE4 on uh, microglia and astrocytes. And to uh, find out whether APOE4 influences microglia and astrocyte responses, we turned into, uh, we turned to a, another large data set that is publicly available of gene expression uh, from the brain of uh, uh, many people. This uh, data set is called ROSMAP and uh, was uh, generated by the Rush uh, University of Alzheimer's Disease Center. Uh, they took um, a piece of brain from the frontal lobe of uh, 635 uh, individuals and uh, uh, did uh, RNA sequencing to examine the gene expression uh, of those uh, brains. Uh, we selected from that data set a, num a, a, a number of uh, microglia specific genes uh, and astrocyte specific genes and then use an artificial intelligence machine learning method called spectra clustering to identify sets of genes that might be uh, regulated by APOE. We determined that uh, if a gene uh, travels with APOE uh, in such a way that is, the expression is higher in APOE4 compared to APOE3 uh, compared to APOE2 carriers, then, uh, or the opposite, if, it, if it is, the expression is lower in APOE4 carriers compared to APOE3 carriers compared to APOE2 carriers, then that gene might be regulated by APOE. Then we did also some statistical modeling uh, to confirm the results of the spectral clustering, adjusting by the levels of uh, Alzheimer's pathology. And when we did this kind of spectral clustering artificial intelligence uh, method in individuals without uh, amyloid plaques in the brain, these are mostly normal brains, uh, we found a cluster of 172 APOE-related genes that follow that pattern of lower expression in APOE2, intermediate in APOE3, and higher in APOE4 carriers. So we suspected that these genes might be then regulated by APOE, and uh, we confirmed that that, is, uh, that that association is statistically significant, as you can see here in this average expression uh, by APOE group, and uh, here are the results of the uh, statistical analysis and, and the uh, p-values of significance. We did the same kind of uh, analysis in people with frequent uh, plaques and found a, a, a gene set of 181 uh, microglial genes that behave the same way, higher in APOE4 compared to APOE3 and compared to APOE2. And when we overlap both uh, gene sets, we got our microglia APOE signature of 87 genes that follow this uh, uh, trend of uh, uh, associated with the APOE uh, genotype, and that is that they are independent of the number of plaques because they are common to people without plaques and uh, people with frequent uh, plaques. A close inspection to those genes uh, reveal very interesting uh, uh, microglial functions that are increased in APOE4 carriers, including inflammatory genes, genes that are associated with the motility of the microglia, with the mo uh, how mo mobile they are, and how they uh, um, are attracted uh, to, uh, to the plaques and the tangles. Uh, as well as uh, genes related to the phagocytosis or engulfing of, of, uh, of amyloid. Um, to finish, the take-home messages uh, from this uh, talk are that uh, the APOE genotype is, seems to be a driver of the heterogeneity in the clinical course of Alzheimer's disease that we see in the clinic uh, on a daily basis. Uh, APOE4, as I showed you, is associated with a faster decline and APOE2 with a slower decline relative to APOE3, even after controlling for all these uh, variables that also can influence in the rate of cognitive decline, uh, like age, sex, education, the amounts of Alzheimer's pathology and the amounts of other pathologies in the brain. 
Such APOE impact in the rate of cognitive decline might be mediated through this microglial gene expression, as I show you. APOE4 microglia seems to be more pro-inflammatory and pro-phagocytic, even in the absence of plaques and tangles. And therefore, APOE4 may uh, make microglia more prone to react, to overreact to the plaques and the tangles, thereby accelerating the rate of cognitive decline. Given the genetic evidence that uh, associates APOE4 with uh, Alzheimer's risk and with age of onset, and also these recent advances in understanding, uh, in, the, in our understanding of the APOE uh, mechanisms, APOE4-directed therapies are being developed uh, to prevent and slow down uh, Alzheimer's. And these are some of those um, therapies uh, that have been shown to be effective in animal, uh, in animal models, in, in mouse models. One approach is to use anti-APOE, anti-sense oligonucleotides, uh, which inhibit or suppress the expression of APOE in the astrocytes. Another approach is to use anti-APOE antibodies, you know, immunotherapy, instead of against A beta uh, or against tau, against the APOE itself uh, to neutralize it in APOE4 carriers. Another approach is to use uh, gene therapy uh, to switch uh, APOE4 to APOE3 uh, by editing the, the genome or by uh, overexpressing APOE2 in APOE4 uh, people uh, through an adeno-associated virus. And another uh, approach uh, is to increase the amount of lipids uh, that APOE4 uh, carries with it um, through these uh, kind of drugs uh, that work on the enzymes that uh, lipidate APOE. With that, I want to thank again the McCourt uh, um, uh, Foundation and, uh, of course, the patients and uh, families involved uh, in uh, research. And uh, um, uh, without them, none of these studies would be possible. Uh, I want to thank also my mentors, uh, Dr. Brad Hyman, who is the director of the Massachusetts Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, John Groudon, who uh, is the founding director of the uh, Alzheimer's Center, and Teresa gomez Isla, who is the director of the clinical core and uh, director of the memory division at MGH, and my collaborators in these uh, projects, uh, Jean Kiang and Rebecca Petensky, uh, who helped with the statistical analysis, and Sudeshna Das, who helped with the RNA-seq uh, uh, analysis, and uh, these young trainees uh, uh, who make me feel really proud. Uh, I wanna... Uh, Thank also the uh, Massachusetts Alzheimer's Disease Brain Bank, uh, who is which is led by Dr. Matthew Frosch, as well as my funding sources. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Could you turn my uh, testing testing? Testing what, can you hear me, is it working? It's working, okay, so uh, very nice talk. And we're now uh, open for questions, both from people here and also from the people who are watching online. So is there anybody who has a question, is someone bringing questions up or raising hands? How are we doing this? There's a question right here at this. Uh, yeah, I'll repeat the question, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Lewy body dementia. We well, can't hear you. We have to make sure the microphone goes on. Thank you. Um, my brother has Lewy body dementia. Will these treatments and this research help in his dementia? Do you want to address that? Who wants to address the Lewy body? I can answer that, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, you, you, I think you are referring to the uh, treatments that uh, Dr. Weiner uh, spoke about, right? So, or, or any treatments, any that you spoke about, that I spoke about, that relate to Lewy body dementia, yeah. Right, so what, what happens with Lewy body dementia is that uh, patients with um, a, diagno a clinical diagnosis of Lewy body dementia, we find them in the brain 
uh, autopsy or if we do a, one of those uh, PET scans that Dr. Uh, Weiner mentioned, the amyloid PET and the tau PET, we see uh, that they have usually quite a bit of Alzheimer's pathology uh, in the brain as well. So um, patients with Lewy body dementia may benefit uh, from uh, the treatments that are being developed for Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, especially if we confirm that they have Alzheimer's pathology in the brain, either with uh, one of these uh, PET, PET scans or uh, with uh, spinal tap, uh, which uh, uh, is another method that we use to uh, detect uh, this amyloid and tau uh, uh, in the brain. And uh, hopefully soon with blood tests, because uh, uh, as many of you may have read, uh, the blood tests uh, for Alzheimer's are around the corner. Uh, they, they, they're being validated uh, as we speak. So um, it's possible that uh, patients with everybody dementia may benefit from um, uh, some of the treatments that are being developed for Alzheimer's disease. So I would agree with that. I think in the vaccine we're developing, the cells that go in could also help clear out the Lewy bodies. So I think it could uh, potentially help. Did you? Did you turn my reptile mic on? <laughs> Perfect. The only last plug I'll make is that we also do have a table today here for the Center for Alzheimer's Research and Treatment, which you can visit after the talk today. Um, that is a center at Brigham and Women's, mostly focused on Alzheimer's research, though we do have a number of clinical trials from time to time aimed at treating other dementias as well. Um, and so those will feature new drugs that are being developed in that pipeline that may be effective in treating DLB. And I know we have a few representatives here today that can give you that information. Why didn't you introduce yourself? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, my name is Dr. Catherine Monroe. That's right, I didn't give a talk, so you won't know who I am, but I'm one of the neuropsychologists at the Brigham and I work on many of the research studies that were tangentially highlighted today and um, over at MGH as well. Yeah, I should add, I should add to that question that, you know, while, while clinical trials for Lewy body dementia are lagging, I to be behind uh, Alzheimer's, uh, we uh, uh, at MGH, uh, uh, Dr. Gompert uh, uh, is running the uh, Lewy Body Dementia Clinic, and he uh, there are several. I think there are several uh, clinical trials active right now on, on Lewy Body Dementia. Uh, you, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I I, I cannot be more precise, but uh, but uh, he typically has one or two clinical trials running uh, at any given time. Okay, other questions? Um, hi, this is a question for uh, Dr. Weiner. Uh, I was fascinated by the nasal vaccine presentation and uh, clear that it uh, clears the amyloid beta. I'm curious for the animal models, is there any question about how it does with functioning and, and cognitive decline? And sort of related question with the uh, aducanumab drug, which has now been approved, clears uh, the A-beta, but doesn't seem to have much effect, and also your sort of thoughts on the whole aducanumab situation. Okay, thank you very much. So there's two questions. One question is our nasal vaccine uh, in the animals, does it affect cognition? I think that's what you're asking. The answer is yes. So the animals that we give the nasal vaccine and it clears the amyloid, uh, they do better with cognition, so it does help, okay? The second question is a big question uh, related to the aducanumab or the adohelm, which was approved by the FDA, uh, a bit controversial, and what we think about it. So I can say a word. I think everybody should comment on that. I think that the, I, I'm, I, I think the FDA was right in approving it. I think that it does clear amyloid, and I think it will help people. It only worked in one trial, and some people said you gotta have two trials. There's some uh, uh, doctors that are using it, others that are not. But the use of the anti-A beta a uh, antibody, like the aducanumab, there's other monoclonals coming uh, in front of the FDA. Uh, denanumab, I don't know what the name of the other one is, and I think those are also gonna be positive, and they'll be used. So I'll let the other doctors address that. Oh, I don't mean, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, with regards to the aducanumab, uh, you know, the, the, the jury is still out, and, and, and uh, we, we, uh, we don't, you know, doctors, we don't like uh, uh, situations when the jury is still out, you know. I mean, uh, um, 
like Dr. Weiner mentioned, one clinical trial was uh, you know, really successful. Uh, the other one was absolutely neutral. And uh, uh, you have to think that these clinical trials are really controlled. I mean, the, the selection process to participate is, you know, uh, th there are a lot of exclusion criteria. These people, uh, these participants are, you know, really uh, selected in the sense that they, they cannot have any other uh, uh, disease, uh, you know, chronic disease. They cannot have, the, so they are, uh, they are not real uh, world uh, participants, you know. So we we always worry about prescribing something that ha has, you know, uh, potential serious side effects and and that uh, had a certain amount of a certain percent of uh, frequency of the side effects during the clinical trials in that very selective population. We you know we wonder if uh, the uh, incidence of, of those side effects might be higher in the in the real world. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so for all those reasons, uh, you know, uh, I feel conflicted about it. Uh, um, I, I'm hopeful that uh, the other two monoclonal antibodies uh, um, we, with the data from those clinical trials, you know, there, there will be a, a, a stronger body of evidence uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, perhaps, you know, uh, a sub at least a subset of, uh, uh, patients uh, that will see a clear benefit uh, uh, um, that is uh, that is uh, clinically meaningful that we see in the clinic, you know. That, uh, uh, but um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, uh, you know uh, definitely they clear the amulet from the brain. Uh, that, there is no question about that. You know, uh, uh, the question I think is uh, whether. Uh, that is enough, or you know, or is it a first step? Is it a you know, stepping stone, or is it uh, you know, uh, how do you trade the, the potential side effects with the uh, uh, potential benefits? Uh, we'd like to see uh, more consistent uh, evidence in, in the you know in the in the clinical outcomes uh, uh, to uh, you know to so that 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 benefit risk ratio becomes more favorable. Uh, I was going to say, as a non-prescribing provider, I, I don't know there's too much else I would add on to what's already been very well said. I think the other thing to keep in mind as well is that the studies that were positive uh, were in a very restricted range of diagnosis, so it may only be helpful at very certain specific time points in the disease and may or may not be helpful. I know I had patients coming in with other types of dementia saying, is this going to help me? And, and we don't really know. Um, I will just echo as well and just again make another plug for the Center for Alzheimer's Research and Treatment that we have a large number of other antibodies and other types of vaccines and treatments that are currently in development um, and, and are at various stages in development. So I, I do think there's a lot of hope for some treatment, whether it be aducanumab or another monoclonal antibody. And um, I think it's all about finding the right fit for each patient and you know what's going to cause the fewest side effects with the most benefit. And so definitely an ongoing conversation with someone's neurologist is crucial. Um, and also just finding the right institution as well. I know there are a number of institutions across Boston that are not currently, excuse me, allowing for the prescription of aducanumab. So if that is something that you're very interested in, you may have to, to go outside of your traditional network as well. Okay. Uh, other questions? I'm looking in the a question over there. Yes. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I'm interested in for any of you, your thoughts on what are some good preventive um, measures to take to minimize the risk of disease onset? Um, specifically, I've heard that those who get consistent, deep, restorative sleep, um, maybe maximizing their, I think it's called the glymphatic system, maybe have a lower risk of Alzheimer's. And I was just curious if any of you could please expand on that. I can, I can jump in to start. So I will say probably the strongest evidence we've seen that I pretty consistently will present to my patients is for exercise and diet, just keeping a healthy lifestyle, treating and minimizing any cardiovascular risk factors, even starting as simple as walking more often if that's all you're able to physically kind of do safely. Um, those are all really great things to help prevent that cognitive decline in the future and just keep your brain and body healthy. 
Um, sleep is very important as well. We do see reductions in cognitive functioning and disorders like sleep apnea, where enough oxygen is not getting to the brain. I think we've, you know, I'll let the neurologists here, since both of your talks were on inflammation in some aspect or the microbiome, I think that that's probably an area that is indicated in people who maybe aren't getting good sleep that, you know, what is going on in the brain? Is there more inflammation, things like that? But you, you might be able to comment on that a little bit more specifically. Yes, uh, so with regards to sleep, um, uh, uh, it, it does look like the, uh, the, the clearance of the waste from the brain happens during sleep, and uh, the uh, memory consolidation also happens during, during uh, uh, sleep. So uh, having a, a good sleep hygiene uh, uh, is important. Uh, um, now, uh, the, the other uh, side of the coin is that uh, people who uh, uh, are, you know, in the process of developing uh, dementia, they tend to have, you know, a sleep uh, a disorder of sleep, and um, uh, so what, what is sometimes this becomes a, a chicken and egg question, right? Was that is it that the process had already started and and and, and, and you know uh, the uh, uh, the amyloid that was was already building up and was affecting uh, the neuronal activity and, and therefore disrupting sleep, uh, or is it the sleep uh, disorder predate, preceding uh, the, the, the cascade of events uh, that happens? So uh, that's still, uh, you know, uh, a, a little bit of a, uh, you know, an area of active research. The other thing I, I should say about sleep is that uh, one of the vascular risk factors people don't think about is uh, sleep apnea. And, uh, you know, it's something that we uh, screen for in the clinic. Uh, um, and uh, we, uh, we, we send people to, to sleep doctors or to uh, sleep study uh, to make sure that there's no uh, sleep apnea going on because sleep apnea in itself uh, is a vascular risk factor. It can uh, increase the risk of strokes. Uh, it can make more difficult to control the high blood pressure. And, uh, and also it uh, in itself can be a cause of memory problems because um, people with sleep apnea uh, don't have a restful uh, sleep. Uh, the brain doesn't rest uh, properly during, during a sleep when, there's, when there are these apneas or uh, interruptions of, of uh, oxygenation to the brain. And uh, that translates into drowsiness in the, in the, uh, and, 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 and uh, poor concentration uh, the next day. So uh, the the best uh, case scenario is a patient who comes with mild memory problems, and then, you know you you screen for sleep apnea, uh, is treated, and you know the symptoms go away. Uh, uh, that's you know the best uh, the best outcome that when we see patients in the clinic uh, is the best possible outcome. And every now and then, there's <laughs> one of those uh, patients with with. Uh, I think that the I understand your question. It's a common question. Uh, sleep is important. I think the thing that the easiest thing, as you said, that everybody could do is exercise. I think that's very important. Uh, intellectual activity, crossword puzzles, etc. We did some experience in the lab where you take mice that get Alzheimer's and we give them environmental enrichment. They, some mice are in a cage with all these toys and they play with all the toys and run on things and, do, and other mice don't. And the ones who uh, run a lot and do all the toys, their brains are better. So uh, that's an easy thing to do, uh, exercise in intellectual activity. Uh, other uh, questions? Over here, another question. When the, uh, when the vaccine becomes available, who do you see being uh, the best candidate and who all could be eligible to receive it? So the question is when the vaccine becomes available, who are the best candidates? I think that it would be, initially we're testing people with mild disease, but I think it would work in more severe disease as well. So it could be across a broad uh, range of people. Initially people who have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. My hope and dream, it's sort of like treating blood That's pressure, right that in the future that people who are cognitively normal, who are normal, will have a blood test to suggest they may be getting Alzheimer's and they could get the vaccine. But we're hoping to apply it across all spectrums. But we have to prove first 
then of course it works, but it's designed across all spectrums. The only other thing we can jump in with briefly is that while we're waiting for the nasal vaccine to be developed, there are a number of other vaccines in progress as well, such as the A4 study looking at treating people before the disease. These are unfortunately a little more invasive as they do require infusions, but um, in the meantime, there are other treatments available that hopefully could help some with, with vaccinations on the earlier side. I don't know if you had anything to add about that as well. Right, so I mean, from, from uh uh, 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 you know, logical point of view, you know, uh, the, the earlier the better, right? Uh, that's what we think in general speaking, uh, because, uh, you know, once uh, the uh, tangles and the, and, the, and the shrinkage has, uh, is widespread, and what is lost is lost. Uh, we think, we don't think there's much, uh, you know, regeneration potential in, in, in the brain, in, in, in the, uh, uh, in the senile brain, uh, but, um, Mm, and that's why we're looking forward also today for uh, trial results, which, uh, you know, will be coming up soon. Uh, uh, those were um, people at risk of developing Alzheimer's because uh, they had already amyloid in the brain with, with an amyloid PET, pos positive PET, uh, but no symptoms whatsoever, uh, normal memory tests. And, and, and uh, so uh, uh, we'll see what the, those results are. But... Uh, um, uh, yeah, generally speaking, we think that the earlier the better uh, once the vaccines are available. Uh, yes, the A4 vaccine, uh, did we explain it? Did you well, it's an it? antibody, it's not, a, uh, it's not really a vaccine, right, yeah. it's, a, it's an antibody, that, uh, it's, a, it's an infusion, uh, a fr frequent infusions, uh, and uh, uh, it's an antibody against the amyloid, and so the idea is to clear the amyloid, but and not by providing the uh, amyloid itself and triggering an immune response by providing, but providing the antibody uh, that is specific for, for the amyloid. Uh. Yeah, so rhesus Burling heads that trial, mm -hmm. and it's a very exciting trial, and it's the idea of treating early uh, using this anti-amyloid antibody, and we hope that it works, and that would be a first indication that you could treat in advance of someone having symptoms. Sort of like you treat high blood pressure and then you prevent stroke. Uh, if your blood pressure is 10, uh, 10 points higher, you don't feel anything, but later on you may get a stroke or a heart attack. So the same thing is true with Alzheimer's. Okay, other questions? I'm looking out into the audience. Yes. There seems to be some new research on the benefits of whole food, plant-predominant eating for brain health. Can you describe any insights that are emerging in that space that might be valuable? So the question is about food. Kind of a whole food diet. Whole food diet. Why don't you talk about that? I can jump that? in first. I know we have a microbiome expert here as well, so I'm sure we can chat about that a little bit today. But most of the research has shown that Mediterranean-type diets are usually the best for protecting cognition. There is a spinoff of the Mediterranean diet called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, and that has shown some promising results as well. Um, I do think actually the question sort of encompassed the most important part of those diets, which is that they tend to be just sort of whole foods, non-processed, lean, um, using healthy fats like olive oil and things like that. Um, and even just a, a little step can go the right way. You don't necessarily have to change your whole diet overnight. You don't need to be, you know, striking all red meat immediately overnight, but just little steps over the years to just help your diet be a little less processed can go a long way just in protecting your brain. But it, it also probably goes along with those cardiovascular risk factors as well that we were talking about. It minimizes any vascular damage along the way. So that's a very good, a very important point, an easy thing to do. And actually uh, in MS, people who are on the Mediterranean diet do better. Obesity is not good. Um, so uh, uh, Mediterranean diet is the answer. Uh, other questions? I, I would add to that that, uh, you know, it's not a particular ingredient, but it's, you know, mm -hmm. the combination of, in, of ingredients of a uh, Mediterranean diet that, that, that makes a difference. So sometimes people come to us, how about this, you know, particular fruit or this particular, uh, it's sort of a, 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 the whole uh, combination that, that makes a difference. There's no, you know, uh, I wouldn't focus on eating a lot of one particular ingredient, but, uh, you know, like having a balance, uh, uh, Mediterranean diet uh, is, is the best way. Uh, you mentioned the microbiome, mm -hmm. and there's data that the microbiome or our gut 
uh, as we get older, it isn't as protective. Mm. And there's certain bacteria, bacteroides and others that we're finding that might be bad for us. So we might be able to do something more specific. And I, I would gather that the diets we're talking about affect the microbiome in that way, but we have to study it. Other questions, uh, either in the audience or uh, online, I'm looking out. Okay, are we, oh, here's another, another question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was just wondering, as far as the uh, research going on for neurologic diseases, do you find that there's, there's carryover with these uh, treatments that are now being introduced where, you know, they might be beneficial in another area, not just with the Alzheimer's? So the question is, is a treatment for one neurologic disease, could it be carried over for another? And the answer is yes. I'll give you a specific example. One of the treatments we're using for MS that decreases microglial activation or inflammation in the brain, we're going to try in Alzheimer's. And certain of the degeneration that might be seen in ALS could help Alzheimer's or MS. Uh, so the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Um, you mentioned the uh, power of the Mediterranean diet as a, as a totality, but I was curious about individual uh, supplementation. For example, I've read some things about uh, L-serine in ALS and possibly for Alzheimer's and also turmeric as an anti-inflammatory. Are there specific um, supplements that may be beneficial? The, so you're asking about specific, are there specific supplements for uh, Alzheimer's? I don't know of any for MS. I think there's Amelix they're trying in ALS. Yeah. Uh, well, but that's a drug. Uh, yeah, right? these, it's, a, uh, it's a combination of two acid. drugs. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so it's not a really a. Uh, um, so uh, I, I don't know about the ALS one because it's not my field, but uh, the turmeric. Uh, uh, um, uh, the turmeric is uh, rich in curcumin, uh, which is an antioxidant, antioxidant and anti inflammatory. But uh, and studies in mouse models that are genetically engineered to develop amyloid plaques uh, have shown that, that curcumin can be uh, beneficial. But uh, the doses that were used in those mouse models were super high compared to the, you know, the, 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 the translation to the human uh, in terms of the dose is not, is not um, uh, reasonable. And if you use those uh, same doses in humans, you will have a lot of GI side effects. And, and mm -hmm. so uh, that's why we don't, you know, despite that evidence from the, um, uh, from the mouse models, uh, we, we, we would need evidence from uh, clinical trials in order to be able to recommend them. And uh, I, I, I don't know that there is a clinical trial on turmeric because, uh, um, you know, it's not something that, that, uh, that there would be a There have been a few studies. I don't think clinical trials, but the data is very mixed. Often mm -hmm. it's looking at one thing. It's also very hard to do nutrition studies because getting someone to actually eat the things that you want them to eat regularly and finishing all of it um, is tricky unless you keep them in a hospital for 30 days and feed them yourself, which most people are not willing to do. So um, I will say that's just a caution of nutrition research is very challenging. I think typically when I discuss with my patients, I'm sure it's probably similar. If it's not hurting you, if it's at a level where it's not interfering with your gut and you feel like it helps, then by all means, you you know, order Indian takeout and high in curcumin and turmeric and all of that. Um, but definitely, if you start to take supplements, any supplements, you should be talking with your primary care physician, your neurologist, because we don't want to add more problems by affecting the gut health, which then can cause negative side effects as well. So um, I think it's, it's often a balance, but there's not really any clear evidence on individual pieces as of yet. Okay, we're coming towards the end. I think we stop at 11.30. We still have time for one or two more questions. Any other questions, either from the you know, people in the room or online? There's one back there, I think. A uh, question back there. Uh, what is the molecule that you mentioned that is going to transfer over from MS to Alzheimer's research? The molecule is a monoclonal antibody. Uh, it's called feralimab. It uh, induces cells that decrease microglial activation. And we're testing it now in MS. I showed a picture um, of microglia being less activated in MS, and we're now going to see whether we can uh, test. We're talking to the FDA about testing it in Alzheimer's. Okay. Any other 
question. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's why we're here. <laughs> so a friend of mine um, was on um, blueberries in the mine diet to see uh, through Mass General, and he was taking them every day. But then, unfortunately, he had to discontinue because he got cancer. But um, blueberries is very good. Um, they have, I think, azazanthins or something and antioxidants, so I was wondering what about that worked. That's what right. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, uh, so um, there are certain, you know, I said before that, you know, uh, 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 that, uh, you know, it's the whole diet and not, not, not any particular ingredient, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, blueberries uh, in particular have shown, uh, uh, Dr. Gronstein, uh, 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 you know, Harvard has shown that uh, blueberries and also nuts, uh, especially walnuts, uh, are particularly uh, beneficial. But, you know, you cannot, you cannot just focus on one single ingredient because then if the rest of your diet is not balanced, then, uh, is you know is not uh, you know you are you are uh, 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 canceling uh, uh, those uh, those beneficial effects. But yes, uh, for some reason, in particular blueberries, because of the uh, uh, antioxidant uh, uh, compounds that, that it has, uh, seems to be um, uh, more beneficial than other fruits. Uh, I will say, if you're interested in learning more about it, there is a good book that I do recommend to my patients called The Mind Diet for Beginners by Kelly McGrain, who's a registered dietitian. And it really walks you through some of the basic science of what they found and just why each of these food groups is important to focus on for things like it's better to have a smoothie with spinach and carrots and blueberries and you know, some of these healthy fats than it is just to have blueberries alone. And so um, it's a great, easy way to walk yourself into that diet if anyone's interested. I think you can get it on Amazon. Uh, I should also add, I think, you know, from the clinician perspective, you know, all these uh, dietary, dietary advices, they are, they are for prevention or, you know, uh, or, you know to slow down uh, in, a, you know, in a mild cognitive impairment phase. Uh, but, you know, later on, uh, uh, the, the, these, uh, you know, other than controlling the vascular risk factors and not, you know, if you are diabetic, not, not to uh, worsen your diabetes with your diet, um, it's probably uh, the the, uh, the the Mediterranean diet is is, is not as effective uh, uh, in in, uh, mo in certainly moderate or severe dementia uh, stages. Uh, I think the priority becomes that the patient um, uh, because there's loss of appetite and loss of weight, the priority becomes that the patient is happy, you know, and eats whatever uh, he or she likes. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I see sometimes. Uh, families trying to enforce uh, Mediterranean diet in, in, in advanced uh, dementia uh, stages, which you know uh, is not really uh, helpful. And, and you know the, what we what we prioritize is that the patient uh, uh, gets the calories that, that uh, you know because there is a tendency to lose weight and to lose appetite uh, over time. So, so that, that's an important aspect. Thank you.